Welcome to week 6 of this course on machine learning operations. In this week, we will focus on model deployment and serving. So far, we have taken a look at various options available for model uh, development. Uh, how do you track the data? How do you track the experiments that you do when you develop models for the first time? As you iterate on the models, what kind of versions that need to be uh, kept track of, what tooling are available, etc. So the way I think you can think about it in a way that's easy to understand is what we have talked about so far pertains to what's conventionally called as a CI, part of the machine learning process. CI stands for continuous integration. So from this week on, we would start focusing on the CD angle of it, which is the continuous deployment angle of uh, machine learning uh, models. So there are two words that, uh, that are there in the title. One is deployment, the second is serving. Uh, there is a small nuance between the two, but these are uh, pertaining to the same thing that we are talking about, which is how do you make a model available for uh, real-world applications to use. Deployment pertains to how do you get the model uh, live, right, so that others can use it. Serving is the actual act of usage of the model in various real-world use cases. And like I said, there is a small nuance, and we will talk about that when we discuss the options available for doing both. At the end of the day, uh, we should start by looking at ways in which the models get used, and let's work backwards from there. So which means we'll talk about the options that exist for serving models. Uh, fun fundamentally, the model is it its own artifact. So you're going to have the ability to use a model that's been trained directly, and you can use it in ways that uh, look like code. Uh, you can use it in ways that uh, embed the model in existing workflows, right, and so on and so forth, which means that the model itself is the artifact that gets used. We saw an example of it in the continuous integration unit testing that uh, samples that we wrote with GitHub Actions. In that, the model itself was actually used directly by exporting and importing the model as a joblib file, and uh, that gets used for testing. So that's one example of serving of the model that I'm talking about. The other way in which the model can be served is by wrapping it inside an API, uh, an application programming interface, which makes it available for any downstream consumers of the model to directly use what's called as the REST protocol and uh, make RESTful calls against that API and get predictions for what they want to uh, predict. So these are the only two fundamental types. You might find a lot of discussion online or in various data science forums about um, serving options, which are many more in number. But fundamentally, the thought process revolves around only these two mechanisms, right? Either you serve the model itself directly as a model file, like conventionally called as a pickle file sometimes, or a joblib file in the case of uh, uh, scikit-learn. In Spark, it's something else, etc. Or it's an API, which means the model's inner workings are abstracted away from you. And what you as an individual need to worry about as a consumer is only invoking um, HTTP requests on uh, using a REST kind of a protocol. So the API mechanism is actually quite popular, as you can imagine. But it's not the best approach for all scenarios. In certain scenarios, the model approach is actually way better. So we would uh, start by breaking down various options available in terms of tooling uh, for each of these two serving options. So what can you do uh, when it comes to an API? Uh, think of an API as a wrapper around the model itself, which means the model is the core artifact which gets you know, trained like uh, we saw in the training programs. And then the wrapper applies on top of it to make the abstractions simpler for, with, for downstream consumers. One such option is what's called as the uh, uh, creating a custom web, web service. And for that, you can use you know, various libraries available within Python, since we use Python for the training model. Uh, you can, of course, use various options available across other programming languages like uh, Node.js, Java, etc. But those tend to be a little more heavyweight. Um, with Python, uh, we can get things done much faster. Um, that's true for building custom web services as well. 
And in fact, in our uh, course, we're going to use something called as fast API. Like the name suggests, it's actually quite uh, easy to get set up with an API uh, that uh, uses the best of Python in terms of its simplicity, in terms of its uh, programmability, but at the, at the end of the day also makes available uh, a web-style um, framework which makes it very easy for us to spin up new APIs. So that's custom web service. And the reason it's called custom is because it's related to the second option that exists. And I'll come back to that word and contrast it with uh, the second option a little later. The second option that exists for wrapping this model is using what's called as a packaged container approach. And again, we will break down what each of these terms mean at a later point in time. So the gist is that uh, the model has a variety of different uh, execution environment variables which are required for it to execute. We saw that in the previous, uh, previous week's lectures. You need the code, you need the model, you need the config variables, you need the data. So how do you package all of that together in a way that makes it foolproof for any execution environment to run uh, the model, right? It could be dev, it could be staging, it could be prod, it could, it could be dev on Linux, dev on Windows, doesn't matter, et cetera, et cetera. So that kind of a portability for the model becomes really simple if you use something called as containers, specifically, if you package all your dependencies, requirements, environment uh, related configurations together into a container like packaging, um, example using Docker, then you can create APIs which are uh, guaranteed to be executable in any environment that supports Docker, right? And that's a very powerful abstraction. And as we shall see a little later on, this has its own advantages compared to the custom web service approach. The key distinction between the two, the custom web service and the package containers is who manages the packaging? Who manages the setup of the execution uh, environment? In package containers, everything is packaged together. So the developer ensures that all that's required for my model to run, like in this case, the data scientist is the developer. Um, all that's required for the model to run is assembled together by the data scientist himself or herself. So therefore, the arrow of responsibility flows linearly. It's easy to understand if something fails, then where has it failed? Whereas with the custom web service op option, usually the data scientist hands off the model to somebody else to develop the API, who in turn hands off the API and the model to somebody else to set up the IT execution environment, which includes things like packages, dependencies, and stuff. So there are more collaborative approaches required for custom web services to be spun up, uh, especially across different skill sets. So which approach is right is really comes down to what kind of resources, what kind of organizational um, teams exist within your company. And you might find that one is easier to do, the second is harder to do, or second is easier to do and justify, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll take a look at uh, this in a bit more detail. First up, let's focus on Fast API. Um, Fast, Fast API is actually a Python-based framework. Uh, it's meant for high-performance web applications to be spun up quickly, and it allows for RESTful applications to be written in a way that uh, makes it very easy and simple to start off with, but you can keep adding complications, or I should say complexity, uh, or, of powerful features that, uh, with the powerful features that exist. So some of the key features that it uses uh, builds on top of the Python stack. So that's why it's quite popular amongst uh, uh, Python users. Predominantly, these are data scientists or machine learning engineers. So one of the first things that uh, uh, the Fast API spent a lot of time on is the ease with which you can get uh, the code set up by using hints. Hints are a specific type of construct available with uh, modern programming languages, especially the later versions of Python. Um, Java also, later versions of Java had it, um, Scala has it, etc. But with hints, you can give certain pieces of information to the code uh, or to the compiler, I should say, which makes it easy for things like default behaviors to be handled in a way that uh, is a lot more scalable. Documentation becomes easier. 
type checking becomes easier, etc. So here for fast API, because it was built predominantly for the machine learning model deployment um, as an API use case, it's got um, the hints feature working for it for uh, doing things like automatic validation of data, uh, mainly input data to the API, serialization that's required for the data sets or data structures to be passed into the uh, uh, API calls, etc. So that's type hints and pydantic. Uh, it's, it's got a really fast performance layer. Um, so what this means is that uh, uh, it's almost able to match the native JVM style execution that uh, both Node.js and, and Java or other related languages have. So the reason this becomes an important point is that for the longest of times, Python was viewed as uh, not ready for production because it was a um, interpreter based language, right? It, it, the language was not compiled into assembly code, which was way more efficient for execution, not really efficient for human readability. Uh, like for instance, Java, C, C++, all of them were are compiled languages, which means you could compile them, create the assembly code executable, and then have that be uh, running at uh, as efficient uh, speed as possible on the conventional x86 architecture, the Intel chipsets or the AMD chipsets. But with uh, Python, the, historically the argument has been that because it's interpreter uh, interpreted language, it's not compiled. So it requires another layer of compilation internally. Uh, usually the Python layers are, uh, I believe, converted to C first and then the C compiled code is then executed. So that extra layer of interpretation and then compilation uh, becomes performance wise problematic. Uh, but that has been a historical argument. Like I said, it's not something that's that's true to the same extent uh, with modern, you know, modern hardware with with improvements in Python itself, etc. So one such claim that uh, the fast API uh, module makes is that uh, it's actually comparable in terms of web performance. Um, so that really boils down to the performance of executing simultaneous web requests or HTTP requests or REST requests on an API which is built using Node.js versus an API that's built using Fast API is comparable. So the throughput is comparable, latency is comparable. That's what this particular claim really means. Uh, internally, it uses something called a Starlet as a as a framework for uh, pretty much the web socket space or web service based implement uh, implementations, but that's that's a detail. Uh, Fast API is also really good at uh, ensuring, uh, again, using hints and uh, related uh, features, uh, documents are auto-generated. And this is useful because documentation has been the bane of almost any developer existence for a long time. Uh, whereas with automation that's built in, it becomes slightly more easier. You still have to give it the right hint and make sure that the program is structured well, modular. Otherwise, the documentation it's generating is going to be practically non-readable. Um, yeah, so it's compatible, therefore, with uh, things like Swagger, which makes it very easy for interoperability. So most conventional API building uh, or testing, I should say, happens using Swagger. And documentation also, uh, Swagger is really good at that. And people are used to using Swagger, so you can actually use the same with uh, Fast API. Uh, testing is, is fairly easy. Uh, it's got uh, certain design elements baked into the entire framework, which allows for injection of like dependencies of uh, certain types of you know uh, distributions of data, uh, both good data, bad data, etc. So it makes it very easy for you to test new um, APIs that you write. And uh, because it's a modern layer, security was baked into it from the very get-go in terms of design. And open auth, uh, for instance, is something that's very very common in most modern. Um, you know, websites, like what I mean by that is uh, today, if you, for instance, log into a brand new service, let's say you sign up for medium.com uh, for reading up about data science, you know, articles, um, you need to have an account to do that. But medium provides, for instance, the ability for you to just authenticate yourself using Google or Microsoft or something like that. Um, and that's great, because then you don't need to create a brand new login for medium, you can log in to your Google account or Gmail account as an example, and then have Google 
um, you know, authenticate for you and then have Google tell medium.com that, hey, I've already authenticated uh, this person so you can trust him. Um, so that's OAuth based mechanisms. Uh, that's an example of it. Likewise, it's got a few other uh, token based approaches for, you know, intermittently or periodically sharing our access keys um, and then key support for the API usage itself. So all of that is baked into the fast API framework itself. Okay, so it's time to do a demo. Um, so let me, uh, you know, switch over to the uh, to the Google Cloud console, and that's coming up in the next video.